and we are recording now. Uh, so today, just basically this morning, I spun up a quick to topic uh, regarding continual learning, uh, regarding neural networks ju that just learn all the time without having to go over all their old, um, all, all, the old, all the old training examples they saw in the past without losing that past knowledge. Uh, and, and just how it overlaps with our models that we've historically done here at Numenta and just, just, just thinking about the problem space. Um, that's, that's the thing I've wanted to present for some time. Um, but then on top of that, um, sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll read a paper or, uh, or I'll see a new model that just, um, expands my imagination about like how the brain might work, uh, how, what might, what is the, what, a, what is the bag of tricks that the brain might be using, uh, that, that are like actually biologically plausible. And um, recently we've been discussing something a little bit that Subutai brought up um, is like meta learning and this thing called MAML, M-A-M-L. Uh, I'll discuss that just in, in when I get to this, but I think it brings an interesting perspective to continual learning uh, in that it, um, it kind of doesn't try to solve continual learning directly, it solves something else, but then it can help us like reframe how you might think of continual learning. And in just in general, I think it's just a cool trick that you can, you're laughing at the cat in my lab. Uh, in general, it's just a cool trick that, um, that is just useful to have. So I thought, I thought it was worth presenting. So I think this is gonna serve two purposes. Uh, hello kitty, I'll put the cat away in a second. <laughs> um, the two purposes are one, I, I can kind of frame some of our algorithms like temporal memory and spatial cooler and the context of neural networks uh, and then the, discuss this problem of continual learning and how it relates to uh, one-shot learning or few-shot learning. I'm going to put this cat up here. <laughs> you already so, tried that. It didn't work for very long, Marcus. I know. <laughs> she's, I, she, is that, is that a she or is she? <laughs> she? She's back she, already. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what to do here. <laughs> so I'll just run with it. Once I'm showing my iPad, it'll be less distracting. So uh, here is what I drew this morning. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, one sentence. I, I'll I'll walk through this in a, in detail in a few seconds. One th one thing. Um, one kind of old idea that I've heard stated about neural networks. Uh, and this predates deep learning. Um, th this idea predates deep learning, and that's that. Like there are kind of two fundamental ways to use a neural network. Like if you're just sitting with an abstract neural network and you wanna hook it up to do something. Um, the two sort of families are, if you want to use them to, uh, you can use them to do memory uh, or you can use them to do generalization, which I kind of depict as that top photo up there, uh, which is just one specific kind of generalization. Uh, everything I'm saying here is a cartoon. It's, it's, not, it's not this clear cut, but I think that this is a useful framing that you can sort of think of neural networks as um, as doing something memory-like or so doing something that's generalization-like, where you define generalization as that as that picture in the upper right corner where you have classes that are at different points in the input space, and you're trying to figure out, you're trying to kind of find the boundaries of those classes in the input Uh, let me fix this. So, um, in my mental model of, um, of a lot of the things we've worked on here, that what we've done is much more, uh, we've done much, spent much more time on memory mechanisms with neural networks and, and some on generalization, but more on memory. Um, so a classical example, going back to the eighties of using neural networks for memory is auto associative memories or hot field networks. And here I've just depicted, you might memorize a, a symbol, a representation by just activating them and forming auto, forming connections between all of those, um, all those active units. And so now a part, now a subset of that representation can, uh, can cause the entire representation to activate. Uh, Jeff has many times drawn the association that a temporal memory is a little bit like an auto associative memory that associates with the previous item in a sequence. 
And uh, so, so temporal memory, I mean, we put it right there in the, in the name, is, is a memory of sequences. It, uh, and we can use it for things other than sequences, but it, at, at its core, it's, it's learning associations between one representation and another. Uh, and I'd, I'd go on to say, like some of our other stuff, like the sensory motor work here, I've drawn a quick little few grid cell modules. Uh, some people here will know why, why I use a rhombus to talk about grid cell modules. Uh, and, and forming these associations between a temporal memory and, and a location. Uh, and I'd go further to say, even, even when we talk about displacements, when we talk about using displacements for composition, um, the whole point of computing the displacement of computing these is so that we can learn it, so we can memorize it. So, so even when we're talking about learning compositional objects, it's still kind of a memory for objects. So, so I think a lot of what we've done kind of falls more into that column on the left than the column on the right. Whereas deep learning, uh, whereas mo mostly any network trained with back, back, prop, back, back propagation uh, is more in the column on the right. And, uh, but, but I will say that our spatial pooler is more on the right. It's, 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 it is our, it's kind of our source of this type of generalization. Now, quick aside, what I've already said, the word generalization can mean many things. Uh, we do have other kinds. We, can, we have like learning an object at one orientation and then inferring it at another. We kind of have that working. That's a form of generalization. So here, when I'm saying generalization, I'm talking about that picture on the top right. Uh, so now, th the topic of continual learning. I, I, uh, I have sorry, a brief uh, statement hey, down here Marcus? Um, with little stars. So uh, with a memory, um, with our mechanisms and, and just generally the way memories work, you can set it up so that each new piece of information, each training example, uh, causes a local change that doesn't collide with existing knowledge. You can, if you introduce dendrite sparsity, you can, you can make a neural network have the ability to store a large amount of information and it, it doesn't interfere uh, with other information. Uh, but on the, on the right column here, uh, each new information is used to choose a better basis. Uh, those arrows, they start to mean something different. They, each arrow starts to represent a different type of feature. Uh, and this can be disruptive to old knowledge. And this is sort of by design. We almost want it to be. I mean, that's, that's, a, um, that's a weird way to say it. We don't want it to be, but, there, but we're getting something good but from the fact that it, that it does disrupt old knowledge. Um, and the instructive example I, I wrote on the bottom here is um, often when you train a network to do recognition tasks, uh, it's a really good idea to pre-train it on ImageNet uh, because you want it to learn just a bunch of uh, reusable, uh, learn a bunch of information that is generalizable. You want it to kind of um, choose a really good basis like this. And, and if you treated this as a pure memory problem where you're going through and just uh, never disrupting your existing knowledge, uh, pre-training on ImageNet would have a less value. I wouldn't say no value, but, but this, this whole disrupting the basis thing uh, is, it, it, it provides a benefit. It, it gives you generalization. Uh, so I'm gonna scroll down here to kind of make a statement. Um, well, because, uh, yeah. Just a quick comment. I think there's a useful distinction to be made there for uh, generalizing to new samples within a class that I think kind of fits the picture you draw with the decision boundaries and stuff. And generalizing to new classes that you haven't seen before. So those are two uh, different problems. One of them, you, you have to improve your, your, your basis to use the same uh, naming you use there. So you improve your basis. So when new samples come, uh, it's easier for you to locate within that reference frame. You can think of like that. And the other one is you have a completely new class and you have to derive new bases from the scratch. And then how do you do that? How well do you derive this new uh, basis for this new uh, reference frame? Uh, I would say no. Um, I, so you, first of all, you're using the word reference frame, but here I'd, I'd be more apt to say a coordinate frame or it's, it's not like a spatial reference frame. It's, it's more like the coordinate system. And, um, but I would say no, like you could take this that has been trained on ImageNet, um, freeze most of the network and just, uh, use a introduce a whole whole new class and 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 just train the classifier to using the same basis 
Like, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying those are two different problems. So one, when people talk about generalization in, in, in machine learning, and sometimes I think the term is overloaded. So one thing is just generalizing to new samples. That's what you expect your network to do. So when you show a validation set or a test set, it's going to generalize to those samples that never seen before. And a completely different thing, it's generalizing to new class. And that's a pre training example you gave. So to, those two are different problems and the, the generalization term there is yeah. a bit overloaded. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, I was mainly talking about the one where you do introduce new classes. Okay. Can I just make a few comments about this before you go on? Yeah, yeah. So Phil, I, I, I like this very much. I think it's a very, uh, I mean, these are ideas we've had, but you're, you're putting nice terminology on it. And so it's, it makes it more concise. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. I'm not really adding anything other than just some color to what you presented. Um, I think even the word spatial poolers suggests what you're saying. It's pooling, which is a generalization step. It's essentially saying I'm putting multiple patterns into some bucket um, and therefore, um, you know, it, 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 so on. Uh, interesting, and, our, and we've talked a lot about how you go back and forth between these two representations. You want to have very specific memories that you can learn quickly, and yet you want to have uh, some more generalization. And I think there's two ways we've made this work so far. Uh, and it's not complete, but there's two ways we made it work so far. One is um, our spatial pooler learns at a much slower rate than our temporal memory. Right? The, the spatial pooler is a very slowly evolving statistics of the many uh, inputs. Uh, whereas the temporal memory works best when it's very fast. You can learn in one step. So that's one way you sort of uh, these things differ. And the other big way they differ is that in our spatial pooler, um, we come up with this basis set, but on its own, it's not sufficient to recognize uh, anything of, of importance. Uh, you know, if we think about, you know, oh, I, is it, if, if we put some pattern into our spatial pool, it's never sufficient to recognize a complete object or an image or a sequence or something like that. And so we use, uh, we use time to do that. Right? Uh, as a basis set, the spatial pool is not sufficient to recognize various images and so on, uh, uh, at least the way we've implemented it. But we then we say, okay, well, we can only, we're sort of classifying or generalizing a subset of the overall pattern. And then we move through the pattern space, either through time or physical space, uh, sensory motor. And, um, and, and that's it's another way we, and so the, that's another way we get around the fact that our spatial pooler is very impoverished in terms of a basis set for us, say, recognizing lots of different images. Um, um, so I, I just put a little color on that. I don't know if that's helpful mm -hmm. if you have any questions about it, but, uh, but I do like this way of presenting this. And, and one, thing I, one thing I realized uh, after thinking about this for a while, so I used to have this in my head, like this clear line, like what you can either do memory or you can do generalization. Uh, but the reality is like these axes, this X1, X2, X3, uh, you, maybe those are, you know, Gabor filters, maybe they're something resembling that. Um, in a sense, you're, as you learn that X1, that X2, X3, you're doing something a lot like memory. Uh, you're doing, you're, you're, you're learning that these things co-occur and in a class is. Yeah, you're, but you're not yeah. learning specific things, right? That's, yeah, yeah. If that, th those X, Y, and Z are not, or X1, X2, X3 are not, um, uh, you're not learning something specific. You're basically learning a basis set by which you will then later memorize something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in our world, our basis set, the spatial pooler, is, is very poor. It's a very limited basis set. I, I don't know, but I imagine tra traditional neural networks these days have a much, much larger representation of that basis set, and therefore you can actually classify it. That's what they're doing. Um, uh, anyway, I, I think we're agreeing about all this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's it's so, a really uh, nice, nice way of looking at it. So, in the way I frame this, it's kind of like on the left, continual learning is the most natural thing in the world. You just do it. You just learn new stuff and put it on new dendrites, use sparsity. It's, it's, it's not a, the way we frame the problem, it's no longer difficult, uh, but it doesn't have so much generalization built into it. Uh, no, whereas, not really, um, right? Yeah, almost, sure, uh, right, right, right. <laughs> to, except for what we get kind of for free from the spatial pooler. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and the column on the right, uh, it sort of was designed for generalization, but then it's kind of horribly bad at continual learning. Uh, continual learning, we didn't even, almost we didn't even see it, it's a problem before, and now it, it suddenly is a problem. 
Um, so how do, how do you get the best of both worlds? Um, I, I thought that there, uh, so this, this is the, the presentation I had composed in my head before yesterday. Uh, now, now that I understand um, some, uh, this approach to meta learning and one shot learning, few shot learning that I'll talk about in a second, and Subutai has also talked about it. Um, it has sort of turned the solution space around on, on me and made me kind of approach this a little bit differently. So um, rather, than how to, uh, rather than solving this directly, uh, let's, let's put the problem aside for a few minutes and talk about solving a different problem, uh, few shot learning. Uh, or so, so learning a class from just a few examples, getting a, you, 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 and, and I say class, cause I, we're talking about classification a lot, but it could be tasks. It could be some kind of regression, the ability to infer numbers. You can talk about lots of things, but I, here I'll just talk about classes cause we're used to talking about that right now. Uh, so, so given just a few examples, can you quickly learn uh, to recognize an, a class? Uh, so uh, yeah, let's talk about solutions to that problem, a specific solution, um, and see if it gives us a new perspective on continual learning. Uh, so, so this brings me to something that Subutai has shown. Sorry, this is doing weird rotation stuff. Something Subutai has shown is, uh, is this paper met, um, that talks about this model, MAML, model agnostic metal learning. And the picture on the right. I can I can just describe this in in words. Uh, what they do is rather than training a network to perform a set of tasks where those tasks are say recognizing a coffee cup uh, or discriminating it from other objects, uh, rather than learning to do that, um, what they do is they allow the network almost it you could say almost at inference time, the, the, the system is allowed to learn much more often. It can learn once deployed in the field, essentially. When it takes on a new task, it learns to perform that task really quickly through like one or two steps, through what one or two weight updates. And when I say weight updates, many weights across the network may be updating, but it's it's just a very fast learn. Uh, so So what I've shown here is that like the network sits at some position, this, this theta where you see it's pointing at a dot um, and, and it learns that slowly. Um, then from task to task, as this network is doing different things, it very quickly learns to jump to theta one, jump to theta two start with the asterisk. Um, and the interesting thing is um, after that task is complete, it almost just throws out those updates. It's, it doesn't keep them or anything. But the, but, but the main theta, the m main position it sits at, learns slowly over time. Uh, I'll just say that again, uh, because I wrote it down here. Um, so imagine neuro a neural network that sits at a position theta. When I say position, I'm talking about all, all the weights in the network, all, whatever types of parameters it has, all the connectivity. What do, mean, what, do you mean by, what do you mean by sits at a position? Is this a pair uh, or some sort of like? Uh, that was just an expression I was I used quickly that doesn't mean much. It, the the neural network, its weights, yes. its connections, are kind of at some stable point that doesn't change very quickly. So this is not uh, an activation state. This is like no. a, a network no. connectivity state. It's a set of weights. I mean, normally okay. we initialize these weights randomly. Yeah. And I think here saying, well, suppose it's not random. We're sitting at. It, the, you, you initialize the network at some position theta. That's a good position. Well, yeah, how do we know it's a, is it, a good position? It's it's a good position because we've had a few samples that suggest that, or it's um, sort of defined by this. What he what he's it's good because you can now very quickly learn new things. All right. Well, that's uh, and then, sort of a, and, sounds and then like a chicken and egg. How you find it? Well, yeah, that sounds like a chicken and egg problem. It. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But but uh, I mean, this is how they've frame the problem uh, yeah. that you Okay, this is, this, is, this is what they, a, a, a picture of what they would hope to be able to achieve. Like you could somehow know what this theta is. And if you've gotten this theta, then you could have this property of, of quickly training. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, they, the, so it's like the, the network is trained over a long time, over many different tasks to 
find a useful theta. Uh, and, and this might sound abstract or strange, but think of this, for example, as theta being a system that understands the, the visual statistics of the world. That, that mm. could be what theta is. is a in a, very, in a very rough analogy, that would be like our spatial pool. The spatial yeah. pool represents the statistics of, of its world in a very simple way. Yes. This, would be a much, this would be a much more uh, highly um, a parameterized way. Yes. Uh, so, so that part's analogous to the spatial pooler, but then the part where that takes a leap and does something new is, um, is that the system then from this point learns something temporary. Uh, you could, uh, like, I mean, one thing you'll bring up occasionally is silent synapses. You'll bring up uh, how the cortex has capabilities to quickly learn a thing that might just be temporary and is going to go away eventually. Um, if you bring that into the picture where you have the system that is at this position theta and then given a few training examples, it can, that, that circuit can suddenly become a classifier for coffee cups. It can suddenly become a, I don't know, a navigator to your bedroom. Uh, you, you can come up with different examples. Uh, this, is, this is the new trick. The new trick is being able to learn something quick on the fly. And the network is, has it specifically chosen a set of weights, chosen a connectivity where uh, just a little bit of quick learning, even if that quick learning is uh, a classifier up top, quickly just learning a new, uh, a new pattern. Uh, this is the new trick. Uh, so, so the new way of framing it. You, you set it to useful theta and then make these quick updates, use those updates for a little while, then throw them out when you don't need them anymore. And can you stay in the form of plasticity? Well, that's kind of, I, I guess the sentence, the sentence didn't do much for me. It, well, in, in, the, in the sense that you, you've got a stable configuration, relatively stable configuration there that you've achieved over a long period of time across a lot of tasks, but then there's this capability of being plastic from that point to you know, to handle a lot of little subtasks, but when you brought up that analogy of the silent uh, uh, synapses, I'm just wondering if you know there is there is a way of if it doesn't evoke anything for you, that, that's fine. But that's so that's kind of so yeah yeah uh, the the silent synapses uh, just some mechanism where where the system quickly modifies itself, whether it's turning off certain dendrite segments, turning off. Uh, syn certain synapses, enabling others, just something that's quick, that is intentionally just used on the fly that you could in the course of a couple seconds just rely on. I mean, our, you know, we model plastic synapses with the, uh, with the permanence, and that is sufficient from a modeling point of view, but from a biology point of view, it's not fast enough because uh, synapses can grow in maybe in an hour, but then they can't do it in a second. And that's where the idea of the biology has, has these silent synapses, which could get around that problem. But from a, a modeling point of view, you don't need that. That's a more of a biological constraint. And silent synapse is just a, it's just a synapse of zero permanence, you know. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, that could be. Let me uh, drop another parallel, Marcus. I think the way you're phrasing it and, and Kevin's question kind of reminded me. So when Florian was here, he would talk a lot about short-term plasticity like really quick, you know, within seconds or milliseconds kind of plasticity. Um, and then there's also long-term plasticity, which happens over, you know, longer term. And so, it, you know, perhaps, you know, these, these updates here are kind of like, um, uh, you know, the short-term plasticity stuff. And then, you know, this is a much slower kind of long-term plasticity. So we make, you know, lots of, let me see if I can, yes. You know, lots of lots of quick updates uh, that don't last very long, but those are kind of averaged over time. Um, and then, uh, but there's there's some sort of memory of of those changes. And then, um, the long term plasticity is sort of making those kind of bigger uh, jumps like this. Um, anyway, I thought that was a interesting I thought just just occurred. If I recall, there's a way you're kind of phrasing it, Marcus. Kind of really reminds me of the, of those two. I, I, wasn't what, was when Florian was here when he talked about that very short term plasticity. I think he was talking about uh, changes at the synapse. Is that right? 
uh, like metatropic changes. Yeah, the synapse. yeah, yeah. So uh, that's that that fits into the whole idea of silent synapses. I think it's like uh, you've got the yeah. synapse, and there's a chemical change can occur at the synapse very rapidly that that could make the synapse change from being nothing to something, or from something to more, or something like that. I'm just trying to relate these things if I can, if I'm trying to do. Um, yeah, so silent synapses could be an extreme version of this where the synapse, you know, really isn't doing anything until uh, yeah. it learns this pattern. Um, I think for the fact that there are that. these, yeah. uh, you know, there are these, uh, you know, plasticity changes that are only occur in very short time scales and yeah. are not long lasting. And then there are longer lasting changes. Yeah. It seems like those are does really parallel what Marcus is talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what I was trying to introduce plasticity was, was trying to relate it to that there, uh, you have different, you know, phenomena here and relate them to different, you know, biological mechanisms, even if one might not know all those mechanisms involved, but it's a, uh, that, that's, that's kind of what I was kind of shooting for there. Yeah. Well, I think we know what most of those mechanisms are now, or at least you have a good sense from them. And, and again, as I said, in biology, it's more complex than it has to be in the neural network because biology has these physical constraints that we don't have in a neural network. So, but as long as we can say, yeah, biology can do these things, then we can just, uh, we can sort of ignore exactly how biology does them. That was a big part, by the way, to me, that was a huge, um, going back decades, this is something that bothered me for a long time about learning and plasticity and, um, and how you know how we can learn really quickly because you know historically uh, again going back decades no one realized that that um, that you could form new synapses or they could modify quickly and it was it, it just didn't fit and then now we know that's possible okay so from here now I'm gonna talk about continual learning again uh, so so what I've shown here is a way of framing the problem of one shot learning or a few shot learning. Uh, um, this does not solve continual learning in, in its current state. It's, uh, it will still, let's see, it, if you learned to classify one object from another yesterday, and then you threw away those, the, the specific weights for that, uh, you haven't solved the continual learning problem. But I think we're just like a quick stone's throw away from solving it. Uh, if you had a really good mechanism for this, it, it, it suggests a really fun trick for uh, for solving continual learning and using both the memory and generalization tricks. Uh, so, um, oops, my app just crashed. Uh, let me bring that back. That was weird. <laughs> Dog sound. So, yeah, uh, I'll say the, the rest of this was like, yeah, so we already talked about this. Um, the network is getting better and better at few shot learning over time. So um, if we have a quick few shot learning uh, mechanism, um, does it give us a new perspective on solving continual learning with generalization? Uh, well, I think the na a natural solution is, well, use your memory to store a, a small set of instructive examples of, of each class uh, and maybe tune those examples to be really useful. Uh, and then whenever you need to go and recognize X or perform that task again, recall those few examples, train your few shot learning network on those examples. And then suddenly you have a model again. So where would you store them? I think there are a number of ways to store things in I mean, is this a, like in a neural network, you just sort of stick it on the side someplace in some memory or? Well, I mean, no, no, I mean, I'm talking about it. Yes, it, it being in neural memory, it being stored in synapses. Uh, let's see, okay. Admittedly, this is at the conceptual level that I've described, like at the algorithmic level that I've, that I've. I mean, uh, what, what struck me is you like stick them aside and then bring them back when you need them. And I'm thinking like, okay, I'm just trying to imagine how biology does that. And yeah. how do you know you need it? And. Um, you know, I don't know what that meant. You know. Yeah. Is this the yeah, same so, as replay mechanisms? Um, yeah, it's, it's along the lines of replay, yeah. So, so Mark, I don't know if you're gonna talk about uh, learning without forgetting and uh, prototypical networks, or? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the, literally the end of the stuff I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> so I was, I'm, I'm uh, let's see, here, here I'm coming in from the angle of discussing these in terms of could the brain be doing this? Does this sound 
plausible. Uh, so, so I'm sure people have done this in the machine learning world and you're, you're giving an example of that. Yeah, I was just gonna add then to use for reference. So from the continual learning perspective, there is a classic algorithm called a learning without forgetting. And that's basically the idea. You store like a few instructive examples and yeah. at every time you see new examples, you see if it's better than the ones you have. And, uh, yes. and then at last time you just kind of interpolate and see uh, whether it's closer to uh, one of the example sets you already have. And that yeah. general idea is, is very much exploring the meta learning scenario as well. So the prototypical networks or the whole field of metric learning kinds of explore that idea that maybe the best way is just a store of examples. And then when you find something and you just look at the examples you have store and then yeah. look at which one is closer, like a KNN kind of thing. Well, so, okay. It's like KNN except but but it's not i'm not i'm not talking about doing anything like k nearest neighbors i'm talking about you have this you the two are kind of inseparable you have this this theta this basis you have this 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 thing that is really good at few shot learning you train it with those examples and um and then you use that so it's a little different from knn yeah this is not knn right this is well they didn't say it's k and k and like but uh, I, I i kind of miss now um so why, why do you start, why do you need to start example? So you keep retraining on them? Well, because, okay, so this, this is the, the, the whole trick is we're willing to just forget stuff all the time. Uh, we, we're, we're not trying to keep the model around. We're not trying, uh, uh, this is the cool trick to, in, in my mind, that um, if you'd asked me before yesterday how I think all this happens, I would have said that we must store useful examples and then as you learn throughout the day, you kind of learn a new model. And then when you sleep at night, somehow all your old examples and with the new things you learned are somehow like merged into a model that incorporates both of them. Okay, uh, so you're talking about, okay, I got it. So you're talking but, about- but, but I have moved away from that with this, uh, with, with this idea of doing fast learning, like that fast few shot learning. You're just always recreating the models. Uh, and when I say model here, I'm talking about the whole ability to generalize, the, the whole circuit that takes an input and classifies it. Um, oh, okay, so this is not it, something that's happening, you know, just occasionally when you're sleeping, it's like constantly happening. Right, so uh, so because we know we can do few shot learning really quickly. Uh, and so if we can do that, what what else can you do once you, if you have a neural circuit that can do that, uh, what else can it do? And, and suddenly uh, it, it suggests a w different way of framing continual learning where um, you, where you do keep around examples, but then you just retrain on them when needed, not just not just all the time. Uh, you don't you don't go to sleep and retrain on everything you did that day. Uh, you throughout your day when you need to. <laughs> uh, I know this isn't going to be everything. This is going to be flawed. But like you get into your car and your brain quickly relearns how to drive. Now that's exaggerating. That's over the top. The one I just gave, but you you get the general theme of of the cool idea, the the trick. I'm glad I know about now. Mar Marcus, when you when you have that theta in um, and you you train to this stable, semi-stable operating point, if you go up one more level of abstraction, um, you could presumably have different. You could have multiple of these these theta ends lying around, depend and that you could be switching between, right? Sure. Yeah. So, the question I have is that if that is the case, that this is this is a kind of, if you wish, a configuration space, okay, uh, where the where there might be a choice of you know. Because I was looking at this trajectory, and I was first I was thinking, well, could it ever branch or something like that? Then I, I was thinking that if it, it, there would be something that could activate different forms of these stable points from which you can branch off of it's if if you wish it's a you know your skills you know that you know and it, you have this theta point that's only active in a particular context, and then from there. You can you can do your little uh, 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 sub uh, thetas off of there, but I'm just wondering what that mechanism would kind of look like if you have that kind of richness where where there's these uh, multiple uh, 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 operating points and then you're trying to find the the one that 
matches best to the task at hand or something like that? It's a good question, Jonah. I mean, that almost gets back to uh, uh, Lucas's, you know, uh, K and N thing. Is that you know, do you do you kind of shift instantaneously between these different operating points, and that gives you the capability of of uh, of uh, getting specificity, but in slightly different domains. I, I think you know what that would look like in a in a neural network. You know, from our point of view, you know, I'm not sure what it maps to as far as extant, uh, 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 you know, computable uh, neural networks. But it it seems like it could be, you know, given what your your insight is, that could be a very rich space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the general idea I wanted to get across was, you know, this this new trick of being able to make these quick updates and and uh, and does that cause us to reframe how we think of how you'd solve all the other parts, other things like continual learning? Because in my mind, that solves a lot of th this trade off here, this uh, the trade off between memory and generalization um, kind of goes away it, it when you frame it this way you don't really have this trade-off between memory and generalization if you have this almost magical ability to just learn models really quickly uh learn you know generalization circuits really quickly it, so, it, it reframes this yes marcus uh, i just go back a little bit to the idea of uh, learning without forgetting and uh, it might be useful to um for the discussion so the idea there, I think it's very similar to what you're discussing. You might correct me if I'm wrong, but so you keep a few prototypical examples and then when you learn uh, a new network, you're gonna, at the same time, you're trying to learn from the new examples. You're trying to keep uh, your output stable with respect to examples you had in the past. So you can train in a distillation kind of way. So you you run a network with the old examples and you, you don't want to disturb the representation you had for these old examples. So you, you keep them stored, so you can keep running them and you can always make sure that you keep that representation stable. At the same time, you're learning uh, new classes. So you have this so, combined loss. See, the thing is like what you're describing is what I thought until yesterday. And and suddenly my big, the big realization is that, is that uh, is that you don't really need to bother with keeping the old examples uh, up to date, or uh, the old, you don't need to bother with keeping the neural network uh, from losing the old examples. Uh, you still, you keep the examples around, the examples themselves. Uh, and then later you few shot learn your model again on demand, but, but the core, the core, let's see, the core basis you're using may have changed a bunch over the past couple of weeks of doing other things. You've been, you know, driving around, you went on vacation, you went hiking, et cetera. And you come back, you have this totally new basis. Uh, you have your old example still, that can, it can, you can still retrain um, over the course of a couple of seconds to do the things you could do before. Uh, so, so like, it's just, I'm, I'm sort of changing the, um, the timing of it all. You're, and I'm changing like, you're not trying to keep a circuit that can do everything. You're, you're keeping a circuit that can quickly learn to do anything and yeah. a set of examples that can shift it in those two directions. Right, that's your point. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that w when you showed that operating point, I think of is that the, uh, you just kind of relate back to, to personal experience when you, uh, when you learn bad habits, when you first learn something and you don't have necessarily the best instructor, and then you struggle at a certain level. You can't get any better because, because of the assumptions built into you know how you learn the thing in the first place. And it takes an active effort to, to school yourself to you know you get a different set of instructions. You get a different uh, uh, teacher or whatever, and they'll show you this other way. And then there's a struggle point where you're flipping back and forth between the two ways of how you used to do something. I, I think in terms of like motor skills or something like that, but I, mean, I think it's also analogous to uh, 
like the, the style of how I've, you know, programmed, you know, has changed over the years. And uh, at some point I realized that, okay, this is holding me back. And then, you know, I'll try to learn, you know, a new paradigm for something and then I'll gradually school myself away from that. But I, I, I think there's these, this notion of these stable operating points uh, is, you invest a lot in it, which is why you you hate to have to learn a different way of thinking about something. But you know, you somehow you have to get the motivation to say, okay, by example, someone else is able to do this a lot better than me. So what is it that they're doing? And then kind of get yourself, you know, schooled over to that. Uh, I, I got to believe that there's 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 something analogous to what you're showing there with these, these operating points that is an important part of uh, trading off between the ability to uh, do something facilely and something, and, and then uh, going through the effort and learning how to do something better so yeah. that you can go on. I, I agree. And uh, I agree, but I also think that, um, that if, let's see if we figured out how to do what you're saying, where you have these multiple operating points, it may still be the case that this picture captures everything because theta can be lots of things. I mean, uh, and these leaps from theta to theta one star might consist of exactly the choice you're talking about. It might be consist of turning off two thirds of the, uh, of the possibilities. Uh, so th this picture still might be a complete picture, but I could translate what you're saying into saying that this, this big theta here actually consists of like, it's complicated. It has multiple, um, it has multiple points contained into it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that you've, you've provided a framework to actually make that, have those kind of discussions. So I, I think it's a powerful paradigm. And, and I'm just channeling things other people have said. <laughs> other than like the, this last part of the using the examples for quick um, for quick training for me that's something that I'm sure tons of people have thought of, but I didn't read it anywhere yet. Fair enough. Can I? So okay. yeah, I, I that's think it the new me. thing uh, I think the new thing in what you're suggesting is, you know, it, 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 I, I'm you know like you're saying I, I'm sure people have thought about similar things but uh, you're also drawing directly the connection to meta learning and the idea that you would actually throw away this local, the quick changes that you made. Uh, and then there's some other sort of theta star <laughs> version of the network that's kind of the, the slowly changing uh, network that you're constantly fine tuning in some sense, I guess. Yeah. But, any, but the quick stuff that you learn, you learn, but it's temporary. Um, yeah. you know, you're kind of throwing it away. And I don't know if people have really done something like that. It makes a lot of sense. It's, to me, it's, it's liberating. I, I, it's just fun, a, a fun idea. I hope it's right. Yeah, I think the thing is, uh, if you think about from the mammal perspective, those, those uh, small changes that are thrown away, you still need to retain some memory of them so that when you make a change, it's still makes your network better at those tasks. But you yeah. don't necessarily want those exact changes because that change could have been bad for something. If, it's, it, was, if it was bad for the task, you might want to move in the other direction. Right? But you still want some memory of that around um, in some sort of synaptic traces or something. It really is a really nice, I think, analogy between short-term plasticity and long-term plasticity here somehow. Yeah, I'm funny. I was just writing down uh, you know, some trace lingering <laughs> when you said that. <laughs> yeah, well, there are notes. traces, and there are there are traces that are that remain in synapses. Yeah. Um, can I try to offer a different uh, personal example? I guess I was wondering sure. if this sort of like fits in with what you're thinking. But I think the closest thing that I can think of that sort of uh, gives an example of sort of that quick learning that you're saying. Um, is like trying to remember a name where you actually can't remember the name, but you just kind of keep on throwing names at it until like all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's it. And then it kind of like, uh, it's as if, I don't know, is that, does that sound reasonable? It's a fun example. I'm, I have to play with that in my head for a little bit. I think the interesting part about that too is it makes me kind of question like what is memorization? Because it's almost as if like 
you can't recall the name off the top of your head, yet you have all the internal, rep like everything there in your mind to be able to sort of play with the blocks enough uh, to be able to re recognize like, okay, this is the right name that I was thinking of um, as well. It's as if like, you have the, the, the target somewhere in your mind, but you can't actually bring it, you know, into uh, like well, a, it, it's almost like you have multiple hash paths to activate that particular specific memory. You know, there's associations, right? So, so the, you, you're basically saying, I mean, there's some people who are great at straight memorization. I'm lousy at it. Um, I, I, I have to do it associatively, but the, uh, you know, there's, but I understand what you're saying is, is well, you know, you, you know, you're being blocked. There's, you know, some names standing in front of the name that you really want to access. And so then you try to go around it and try strategies and just to activate somehow that thing that pops up the name that, oh, okay. Because once you hear it, you know, then there's all this recognition, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was it. If someone tells you what it is. So it's, it, it's I, I I I agree. It's an interesting thought experiment to see you know what possible mechanisms would be involved in in uh, in making that kind of phenomena happen. Yeah. And one follow up. Uh, Jeff at one point asked, "How do you store the examples? What does that even mean?" Well, one one angle on this would be uh, some of the tricks that we've that we know about. <laughs> Like maybe this is a way to incorporate uh, like memory, uh, uh, explicit memory networks with these kind of explicit generalization networks and treating them as working together. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, using things like the temporal memory and all the ways that we talked about creating models of objects, uh, it could be some hybrid of these two. Uh, one question there, Marcus. So if I understood your model correctly, then the next question to ask, and I'm curious to hear your perspective, is how do you decide uh, which examples you want to keep? And I'm, I'm not assuming you're going to keep them at the input space. Uh, I'm assuming you're going to keep them at some latent space or whatever. It can be both. But how do you decide which examples you want to keep? Which are the prototypical examples? Uh, my answer is I totally agree that that's one of the next logical questions. Uh, I, I think choosing a random subset will, will work and then you can definitely do better than random, but the, but that's, that's the best I've got. Uh, the exact way you go about choosing which examples you want. I, I mean, this, this, this is kind of like some classic machine learning stuff, like pro, uh, proto, learning prototypes versus learning Anyway, the point is keeping an instructive set of examples is a problem that has been studied a lot. And I don't, I don't, past that point, I can't say much. So the, so the prototypical examples you might store might not even, I mean, it starts to get into like, I don't know, Plato and the perfect apples and stuff like that. Like you might, you might be storing something that you've never actually seen a, per, a perfect form of it. Yeah, I, I could almost argue the opposite too. Um, yeah, because it, it's I think prototypes might be helpful, but you might also want to store the ones that are right at the boundaries. Um, so the ones that are uh, that really discriminate between a cat and a dog, for example, or an apple yeah. and an orange. Just the, it's the um, because if you just train on the prototype prototypical examples, you can move the decision boundaries quite a bit and make lots of mistakes and still classify the prototypes correctly. So it seems like you need to remember the unusual uh, stuff yeah. too. Yeah. Could, could you scroll back up to where you show the uh, theta for a second? So I'm just wondering to, to take what Subutai just said, if the theta one, theta two, theta three define a kind of subspace at that point. So if you have the extreme examples, you might be able to, uh, that might be the most fruitful thing to say, okay, I need to play around within this subspace and then, you know, to learn the next example of whatever that is. So the extreme examples give you the, the best discriminative capability of, of, or excuse me, the, the least literally dependent subspace in which to, to couch whatever that is. I mean, I, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm making an analogy to a continuous space, you know, to something that's relatively discrete. But, you know, I, 
I, I, I, I still like this kind of point from which, you know, there are these other things kind of spawn off. And once you get to there, then there's uh, the secondary thing of saying, okay, so I learned the cat and the dog and someone throws a raccoon at me. Uh, okay, I can kind of span them between theta one star and theta two star or something like that. So, so as, as to which ones were, would be retained, it might be the ones that share the least characteristics in, in one axis, but still have a commonality because of uh, the theta uh, point that they're starting at. I mean, that would be the most efficient if, you know, uh, I don't know if the brain is, is that efficient, but that would seem like the, the, uh, uh, the if, you're, if you're trying to uh, compress that space, that would, that would be your, your best option. Yeah, I think the one thing, again, going, uh, if we were to draw the analogy to mammal is that you also have to have a notion of how good each change was and incorporate that. So it might be that, you know, this was a good change. This is a good change. And let's see if this works. <laughs> and this is a bad change, right? In that case, uh, what you'd want to move, what the direction you might want to move is somewhere like this, right? Away from the red and, and more towards the green. I don't know if that was clear or not, but anyway. <laughs> Well, I mean, if, if the point of it is to try to recognize something that, you know, the points of, of feature tangency, you know, that, okay, well, the closest, you know, when you say, you know, is this, does this fall into this particular uh, classification and you try to, you know, the simplest thing is, is to say, okay, how many shared features does it have? Or is there, uh, the other end of it is, you know, is there some kind of gestalt global thing about it you know it says okay it's got four legs you know or it's this size or something like that but all those things are are encodings into that space so we make a decision of this thing is the closest example of something else that i've seen you know that's maybe what you go with i have another question do you think that yeah. this is more of a like a supplementary um, sort of mechanism for continuing? I guess in my mind, I, I just think about like I'm wondering like you know I'm not every single thankfully every single time I come to the stand up meeting I'm not having to like you know re remember like oh you know that's Marcus you know that'd be kind of uh, you know mentally painful but um, I can see this being something of like a like more supplementary of like you know I haven't played soccer in like four years and you know I'm, now I'm gonna like you know de rust a bit you know the sort of mental skills. Um, through something like this, potentially. I, I, uh, I like, let's see. I almost wish we had a word that was like supplementary, but a little bit, uh, makes it seem a little bit more important than that. To me, this seems like a key mechanism of, of how the brain is doing what it's doing. Uh, it's not everything. Uh, and, and I'm like, I, in some ways, when I talked about driving, I was like, I was already pushing the limits of like, okay, this, this clearly can't be everything. There's no way you get in a car and relearn to drive each day. Uh, but, uh, but it, to me, it seems like an important part. So yes, supplementary though, I might choose a different word that I can't think of right now. Where maybe, it's, it's, it's maybe key, augmentation, everything. maybe augmentation. Maybe. But, um, Marcus, this is one of the core components. Yeah. The, the idea is you're, go, you're go keeping, on. they apply to generalization to new samples because you're talking about storing a few examples of classes you've already seen. And then when you need to uh, do some inference at that same task, same class that you've seen in the past, then you can just replay those very fast and then adapt again. But that only yes. applies for generalization to new samples. That's the kind of what we do in supervised learning. Whereas in the continual learning setting, we're doing generalization to new classes, and then this doesn't apply. Is that correct? It, well, it does. It, the 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 previous examples you've stored away don't apply, correct? But this theta that you have learned over time does. So, so yes. So, so yes and no. You're correct. Like like this this general approach does attack that problem. But you're right that the examples you've saved away don't play any role in that.
Okay, anything more? Yeah, I have a few things. Sure. Um, so, I, first of all, I apologize. I don't understand this deeply yet. I mean, obviously, uh, you guys have a deeper understanding than I do, and Marcus is sort of a, a light bulb went off in your head on this. I, that hasn't happened with me yet. I just don't understand it well enough yet. Um, but I do have, but listening to conversation, it, it reminded me of the way that I think I know how brains do these things. And, and this may be in addition to the methods that I know about. Um, so I, I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying there's other methods I know that the brain uses to do continuous learning and to do generalization. And I thought I would just state them again here so that just to remind ourselves of what those other mechanisms are. Um, the, the first thing about continuous learning, and I think this is what Mark, I mean, Subutai was saying on Monday, um, basically, is that if you took a traditional neural network and you sparsify its activations, and instead of each uh, unit or neuron having one set of synapses, it has multiple sets of synapses, you can think of it as dendrites, then you can do continuous learning um, without catastrophic forgetting because every time you learn something new, you can learn it very quickly. And if you do it on an existing set, of, a new set of, uh, a new dendrite branch, if you will, or, um, then um, you, all you're doing is you're, you, you're changing. If I think about a representation that represents something, some of the units that are active, only a very small subset of those units that are active would have learning occurring to them. And they would not modify the one dendrite that the, cell already had, it would just add a new one. And so the cell now would respond to two different things, but the set of activations really wouldn't be impacted at all. Um, so that's the idea that you could, by combining sparsity of activations and uh, multiple sets of synapses or dendrites on each neuron, you in theory should be able to do um, uh, continuous learning on a traditional neural network. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I phrased that right, it, it, that's, but I think that's what you were talking about on Monday, Um, um Yeah, that, that's okay. part of it, yeah. Uh, and now, in terms of generalization, that doesn't give you any generalization. Um, and I just want to remind you that there's, there is a couple forms of generalization that uh, we kind of deduce or know that uh, the neocortex does. One is we haven't modeled it all, and we haven't put it in any of our papers, but uh, we've talked about it. Uh, I just want to remind you what it is. In, um, in our cortical model, the HTM model, the, uh, an object is represented by uh, an arrangement of other objects in some framework. And um, so it's like a, a reference frame that's populated with other reference frames because each reference frame represents an object. Um, that was uh, the idea of, uh, anyway, that's, that's, that's the general idea. And when you, um, when you are presented with a new object, you don't know what it is. Uh, what you do, you can observe yourself doing this, is you attend to different features of the new object. And as you attend to different features, you're essentially building, you're, you're looking at a subset of the components of that object. And that subset could be shared with a previously learned object. So if I'm looking at an object that has 10 features, I look at five of those features, I could say, oh, those five features are arranged similarly to how I've seen it in a car. So this might be like a car or and another subset of five features might be similar to what I've seen in um, a desk. And there I say, oh, maybe this is similar to a desk. Um, but it's an active attentional process where you're, where you're moving point to point attention, attending to different features. And, and this is what we do when we don't understand something. We look around to see an arrangement of some arrangement of the subcomponents that are similar to the arrangement of those components in another object. Um, and that's, a, I think, a really powerful form of generalization this is what we do when we don't uh, know what something is. We look around and attend to different features and we say, oh, it's going to be like a cat because it has ears like a cat and has paws like a cat, even though its tail is not like a cat, something like that. Um, so that, I, think that's the, I think that's what's going on in the brain. That's the most powerful form of generalization that's going on in the brain. We've also talked about other forms of generalization in terms of um, scale and variance. Uh, in time, uh, uh, tempo and variance, but I think those are minor um, components. So ultimately, I think if we want to get to a truly, really generalizable system that says I can look at something new and figure out what this thing is and figure out how it works and, and guess at what, how I should interact with it, it's going to require that attentional uh, mechanism you know, framework of 
uh, of you know, reference frames. But I think we could do a continuous learning right now in existing neural networks, uh, even if it doesn't give us generalization. Uh, I just, I don't know if that was clear, but I just, uh, and now those can be in addition to the mechanism you just talked about, Marcus. I, I just don't understand the mechanism. Is that yeah, just, yeah, that was clear. In my head, the, 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 the new trick that, that influences the way I see other things is being able to make these quick updates for the task at hand and, and just having that ability. As, but that, but that gives you generalization, it, that gives you generalization as well as uh, continuous learning, is that right? Yes. Yeah, where, where the continuous learning I just mentioned didn't give you any generalization. It just is a, is a quick update, but you get no generalization from memorizing a new object yeah. uh, with sparsity and dendrites. So, so Jeff, uh, I have a question on what you just said. So say you, you see something entirely new and then, you know, like a subset of the features looks like a dog and a subset of the features looks like a cat, but it's not really a dog and it's not really a cat. So how do, how do you see that forming up? So would, you, would we make a new reference frame for this new thing that we don't really know what it is, but it's- Yeah, yeah, dog. you would. Um, well, I, I think that's a question of how quickly and permanently do you memorize the new thing? So, um, as I wrote about in, uh, and we talked and I wrote about in the book, I think when you're going around the world, moment to moment, every day, every minute, you're doing something, you're attending to different objects continuously, multiple times a second. And I think, uh, Marcus is the first one that clued me into this, <laughs> um, but I think when you're constantly building a model of everything you see, it's a, even if it's a temporary model, the example I use in the book is like, you look at the dining room table and you just glance around the table and you built a model where the potatoes are, where the green beans are, where the, your water glass is and so on. And you can act on that model immediately um, because it's, it's it, in some sense, you're constantly learning everything all the time, but that model, most of that learning will fade. And so a little bit later in the day, I won't remember where my water glass was. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter anymore. So, um, was, so I think you can, you can continually learn one shot learning all the time this way, but you, um, but you could forget things quickly um, because many things in the world are, you don't need to memorize everything all the time. Um, but if I, if I continue went back to my dining room table and the potatoes are always in the same spot every single night, uh, that would reinforce that. And eventually I would just learn that's where potatoes are. <laughs> um, but otherwise I would sort of forget it until the next time and then forget it. So there must be some sort of trace that continues on, but, um, uh, but I, I don't, I'm trying to remember what you actually, your original question was Lucas, but I, I think you can learn continuously one shot all the time and just forget things <laughs> that aren't repeated in, in the sense of the permanence type of thing. Did I answer that question? <laughs> I forgot what your question was. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my question was, if you see like an entirely new thing, which is not a dog and not a cat, but I think your answer is yes, you're continuously building models. You, you'll, you'll learn that thing immediately. You'll just, it's like learning, it's like walking into your dining room and seeing a new arrangement of dishes. You'll learn it immediately. Um, it's, and um, yes, I think you would learn it immediately. It's just, it wouldn't be permanent. It would fade unless you kept reinforcing it over and over again. I think in terms of uh, our research agenda here, I, um, I know we can do this as continuous learning with the dendrite stuff. Maybe the stuff you talked about here today, uh, Mark, could fold right into it too. I don't understand it well enough. I think the generalization component I just talked about, it's going to, requ it's going to require reference frames and displacements and attention. And so that's a, a, a bigger thing to bite off. And um, uh, we probably won't be able to do that right now, maybe in a bit. <laughs> uh, so Jeff, based on what you just said about the, uh, mul about the, the um, continuous learning in neural networks with multiple dendrites, do you, does that basically mean that um, uh, two individual units could have multiple uh, s s uh, weights or synapses between them? Um, yes, but on, uh, but on different dendrites. Okay. 
So unit A, I think, you know, like neuron A and neuron B can be together uh, representing dog. They could also be together representing car, but it, the connections, of, uh, the, the car representation and the dog representation would be used different dendrite segments. They wouldn't be on the same dendrite segment. The whole point is to separate out the space um, on different dendrites. Um, uh, uh, but the, the number of units and uh, the sparsity of activation would always be the same. But any two units, if, let's say if a, if a, a neuron was active 1% of the time, um, that's, we have 1% you know, activation and sparsity, then um, uh, two particular neurons would be coactive every 10,000 times. Um, and so if I learned 30,000 things and on average they'd be, they, those two units would be shared in three things. Um, obviously if the numbers go up to four or 5%, then it's, it, it gets, you know, then it'd be 40 and you know, 400, that's more than numbers. But, uh, but yes, you would, it just that two units would not be co-activated very often uh, for different objects. But, and even then, if I, you know, let's say in a brain, I might have 20 or 40 of these units active at once, even if um, two or three or four are um, confusingly coactive because they coactive in some other pattern, the entire 20 or 40 neurons would, uh, is still very unique. And that's, this is sort of the properties of sparsities that we've talked about over the weekend here. Was that clear? Yeah. So you said, I think you also mentioned that that would be good for continuous learning, but not generalization, right? It seems to be. Um, well, I know it would be good for continuous learning because it's essentially you can do it's, 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 it's more like one shot learning all the time. Um, it's not like you're modifying all the synapses continuously. You're just continuously adding new dendrites <laughs> you know, um, when necessary. Um, but I don't see how that gives you generalization. And I, I miss, I'm missing something here. It's more along the lines of what, what uh, Mark started with, the temporal memory as an example of a very fast learning mechanism, memory mechanism, but it doesn't generalize at all. Um, and so, um, um, I, I mean, you know, I'd speak carefully. If I said you take a traditional neural network and you do it this way, it's not every single training example is going to have a new dendrite. <laughs> that's, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, but uh, it would be more like, um, um, I, don't, I actually don't know the rules. Maybe it's a entire market, somebody could play it. But, you know, most of the time we would be modifying the synapses in an existing segment. Like, oh, this is another cat. This is another cat. This is another cat, whatever. Um, but here's a new thing completely. Let's form a new, um, it's, it's not close enough to something we've seen before. Let's form um, 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 a new dendrite segment to, to, to learn it, that kind of thing. I see. Subutai, did you want to say something? Um, it was kind of switching gears a little bit. <laughs> okay, I'm done with this. Um, okay, so uh, so you you reviewed the Neil Burgess paper and uh, Andre uh, Bikansky paper uh, yeah. on Monday. So both of them replied on Twitter because uh, oh. we, we we tagged them. Um, so I thought I uh, it, it's probably I think it's worth you looking at their piece. They they okay. referenced a couple of papers, but I'll just share it on the uh, screen briefly for you, um, and I'll I'll send you the link. There. So uh, we had uh, mentioned our research meeting here in the uh, on Twitter, and Andre uh, actually did several replies with a bunch of details in here, which might be interesting. So it's like nice discussion of our recent review, a couple of quick takes with distal visual cues. Head direction needs no ego allo transform. That's a feature of most head direction models, and the point is explicitly made in in this other paper. Uh, let me talk about with distal. Uh, so I think I think I'll this is have to look at reading that paper. in more detail. Yeah, I think yeah, it's the paper. I mean, detail. I you know I did while I was reading the review paper, I did do a little research on how people thought head direction cells came about, and I don't know if I I don't know if I ran across their particular paper about that. Um, but uh, the ones I did look like, I I felt I found them insufficient. So I need to look at their paper and see. Um, I don't know how 
you don't have to make an ego allo transform. I mean, it, it, obviously you have to get some sort of features that lead you to an allocentric model. Um, um, yeah, we might want to, it, it yeah. might be worth bringing him on at some point just to yeah, talk yeah, through these yeah. because well, I didn't know, quite understand could, we, this. Well, we could review that paper, which would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they had a bunch of more detailed uh, comments. I'll send you the link on Slack. Or, yeah. or, or a uh, it, it, of this. I hope they, I hope they weren't, uh, they were not unhappy with my review. Um, no, it's a uh, nice discussion of our recent review. Looks like he had read, watched the whole thing. And then Neil Burgess, uh, let's see if I can. Um, he also kind of retweeted this. And he said, nice discussion. Great that you put your journal clubs online. So I think he appreciated that. And then he pointed out a couple of papers on integration of reference frames in neocortex. So I think we've discussed some version of these before. Um, one of them, I think it's this one, basically says there's lots of different reference frames. It's not like there's one reference frame oh, yeah. in the neocortex. Um, but I think we're taking that to a whole different level with every cortical column having its own reference frames. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to point uh, out muted. we can see. Uh, oh, I, well, I'd, I'd like to point out that we can see on your screen right now that you don't follow Jeff Hawkins on Twitter. Who? Uh, but I don't. You, I don't. Subutai. I know. It's just funny that Subutai doesn't follow Jeff on the route. Yeah, because there's no point in me following him, Jeff. <laughs> I don't tweet. I, I, I've become so disappointed in, in, in this trustful in, uh, social media. I just really just don't like it. Um, but yeah, I, used to follow, I used to follow Jeff because I think at one point he did do a tweet. I did one tweet. <laughs> yeah. One tweet my entire life. <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, one reason to follow him might be if other people tag him, I would see it. Yeah, uh, I, I, um, uh, well, I appreciate this. I, and, uh, you know, I'm always nervous, you know, reviewing people's papers, you might screw it up somehow. So I'm um, glad they didn't think yeah, that. Yeah, uh, uh, but they do uh, like it, and I'm sure. Sure. Um, and I think Andre had said he's happy to continue the discussion off Twitter. Yeah, um, I, I would Neil like would to, hard, I would like, you know, uh, if they're listening to this by any chance, um, I would like to, um, I would like to do this, but as I mentioned in our standup meeting today, I am not going to do anything at all after, until I get this next round of the book done. So yeah. I'm going to ignore all this right now. I can't. Have, I don't have time to look at any of this. Um, yeah. So that's going to be at least a week. Uh, so I hopefully remember to come back to this uh, a week from now. Yeah. No. No. I think. Uh, I think. I'm sure. Speaking for them, they would be fine with that. They're not. Yeah. I I think they're they're happy we're really looking into these in, in a lot of detail. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, I appreciate that, and uh, uh, and I appreciate them engaging with us. So um, that's great. I just um, um, I'm frustrated actually because I can't really do a bunch of things I want to do right now. So I, I have to just I'm on a deadline, and I'm like slave to the deadline. So. Um, Maybe maybe we could put the, maybe someone could remind me next Wednesday. <laughs> to go, say this again on Wednesday next week. But to, who who wants to put in a jeer in for Jeff? I can I'll put it in my calendar. Or put a jeer in. That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> jeer that starts Wednesday, <laughs> a week from now. So it's it's due. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think well, my, we could probably I stop think, recording at this point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll stop recording then. Bye, everybody. All right. Thanks.